Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this event of Gala LGBT Humanists here at Conway Hall. Uh, I'm Richard Onwen. I'm the chair of Gala. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about our work, there is literature at the back. Uh, there's leaflets, newsletters, and also feel free to come and speak to me or any of the other committee members who are here. There's Adam at the back on the bar, and there's Chris and Josh there. Do you want to wave, guys? Um, and do please stay around after for a drink and a chat. And it's my great pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, uh, the Chief Executive of the British Humanist Association and a former chair of GALA, Mr. Andrew Copson. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure, obviously, to come back to GALA and, and, and speak to you again. I'm going to talk about objections to humanism uh, this evening, and there are three reasons why I've chosen that as a title. The first is that I think it's a very good way of uh, understanding something better, especially a concept or an idea or, or a, a worldview as humanism is, if you try and look at it from, as it were, the other side, if you try and probe the difficulties with it, the criticisms that can be made of it, um, the, the ways in which people have sought to undermine uh, and refute it. So that's the first reason. The second reason, I'm making an assumption that there aren't many anti-humanists uh, out there in the room. Uh, not necessarily a, a valid assumption, I know. Um, but on the assumption that there aren't, I think it's also uh, a good thing to be self-critical, not just to understand um, a view better or seek to understand an idea better by exploring the objections to it, but also to actually do that mental spring cleaning that everyone who's responsible and critical thinking will do from time to time to test your own assumptions and beliefs and philosophy uh, and find out um, if it's still uh, valid or not. And the third reason is that it's uh, the title of a book um, that was published in the 1960s by one of my predecessors um, as chief exec of the British Human Association, a man called Harold Blackham, uh, published the book Objections to Humanism, which is long since out of print and which almost no one has ever read. So it's a very easy talk to write because you can plagiarize completely <laughs> without any fear um, that it will bite you somewhere down the line. These objections that I'm going to discuss, they're all, you've probably heard some of them uh, from people who've uh, arguments down the pub or people on uh, the big questions or other nutters of various uh, varieties, shades. They're all objections. They're all objections that have been made uh, to me. And not to spoil the ending too much, but I'm not going to find that any of them hold any particular uh, water. But let's give it a good go. And if you have further objections at the end um, that you've encountered and that I've not thought of, then you can do so. There was a review of um, Harold Blackham's book, Objections to Humanism, uh, in 1968, that said that it had done a good job of praising with faint dams the whole idea um, of humanism. And I think that's what I'll go for this evening. This is one of the first uh, main objections uh, to the whole uh, worldview of humanism that you've no doubt encountered. This idea that somehow, if you say that human beings are not the pinnacle of creation, if you say that uh, they're not um, the cornerstone, really, of the universe, if you say the universe wasn't made for us, that we're not at the center of it, that we're not the special um, purpose uh, of reality, then somehow you've toppled uh, humanity from its pedestal and we've landed down in the dirt um, behaving uh, like animals, red in tooth and claw, or um, as it uh, was put to me by one uh, schoolgirl girl in, in, in South London, I'm not related to any monkey. There's another alternative, which you know, if this is true, why are there still monkeys, um, which some of you uh, have probably uh, heard. Well, this is an extremely common um, and to some people, extremely persuasive and powerful argument. They trot it out so often, they must think there's, there's something in it. Has anyone heard of the organization Answers in Genesis? No? Yes? Oh, unlucky. Well, <laughs> um, this is a, an evangelical organization which does really precisely what it says on the tin. It believes the answers are in Genesis, all the answers to all the questions that you might uh, possibly have, uh, but certainly the answers as to, where, to the questions of where we've come from. Um, and how we originated. And they made forays recently, well, a few years ago, and actually three or four years ago, uh, into the UK and distributed various literature to schools. And one of the uh, pamphlets that they distributed had a little uh, cartoon in it. There was the City of God, 
drawing of city on one side of the page, uh, city of God, um, and it was very clean and shiny, and men and women were walking hand in hand, um, looking after their children, everyone had plenty to eat. It was gleaming, and there was a beautiful flag uh, flying over it. It was built on solid rock. Beautiful, beautiful city, everyone wants to live there. And then the next frame was the city of humanism, uh, which was decrepit, crumbling, um, it was built on sand, women were throwing babies out of the, uh, the window, uh, the flag was all uh, tattered and ruined. And the idea behind that, basically, um, is one that's rehearsed quite often by opponents of, of the idea um, that we are not specially created, but a part and parcel of the natural world, which is that if we take away, especially from children, the argument is often heard, if we take away the idea that human beings are special, and special in this particular manner, that we are the center of creation and, and um, the object of a, of a deity that loves us, then somehow that will fatally undermine human morality, good behavior, and human civilization, and we'll end up throwing babies out the window. Well, there are many parts of the response to this argument um, but one of them um, is, and this is going to come up a lot, simply just to assert um, what the evidence tells us. W you may want to be the apex of creation and believe that the universe is created for you and that everything is configured around you and you are the great end point of a divine odyssey. Um, but if you want to live your life with eyes wide open in correspondence with the facts we can observe, then you'll be doing so, at least in some part, in the knowledge that you're seriously deluded. Because what we know, uh, this is a good uh, little quote from Stephen Jay Gould, what we know is we are here because one odd group of fish had a peculiar fin anatomy that could transform into legs for terrestrial creatures, because the earth never froze entirely during an ice age, because a small and tenuous species arising in Africa a quarter of a million years ago has managed so far to survive by hook and by crook. We may yearn for a higher answer, but none exists. And this is part of what we'll become quite familiar with in the next uh, uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, the first part of, of the response to most of these objections to humanism um, is that if you want to live life in correspondence with reality, you at least have to give some ground. But the second part of the response to this objection, I think, has to take on uh, the claim that this acknowledgement of human beings as part and parcel of the natural world somehow degrades us or will necessarily degrade us um, as moral beings. We'll be just animals is often uh, the, uh, the accusation if we accept this proposition. We human beings are just animals. Terrible insult to other animals, obviously, most of whom live highly cooperatively and quite well, um, better than uh, many human beings. Um, but you sort of know what the objectors are getting at. They're saying, you know, this will undercut humanity. So I think it's also important to make the point that being part of the natural world, accepting the interrelatedness of ourselves with every other part of this planet and ultimately other elements of the universe, does not make us bestial in that critical uh, sense. Nicholas Walter, uh, some of you knew him, I know, um, editor of New Humanist magazine for some time, famous anarchist as well as a famous humanist, did a series of talks on Radio 2 where he talked about humanist approaches to different big questions, big emotions. He did fear, he did uh, happiness, he did love. And this is uh, a quote from his talk on love. Plants and animals reproduce themselves through sex, and many animals bring up their young. But it is love which makes sex and the family truly human. The personal love which binds parents and children, lovers and friends. The impersonal love which binds society and humanity. This isn't to say that you can't have sex if you're not in love, by the way, as one very angry audience member uh, accused me of saying. Um, uh, uh, London humanists, actually. Um, but it is to say um, that there are degrees um, in which human beings, although part and parcel of the, of the animal world and the natural world, nonetheless can be distinguished from other parts of it. We're all, even if it's just a spectrum of consciousness or a spectrum of, um, of sociability, we are on uh, a far edge of it. And we can preserve what makes us human, what centuries, millennia of thinkers, including religious thinkers, have thought is uniquely human. It may not be entirely unique anymore, but it is still distinctive. And that's an important part of our response. And I think the third part of responding to this objection is to really question whether or not the picture is diminished at all. The claim is that humanity is toppled from its pedestal and is degraded and reduced and diminished by this idea that we're part of the natural world and that God didn't create the universe for us. I think there's good reason uh, to question uh, whether that 
is sound. James Hemming, one of the vice presidents of the British Humanist Association, who's writing here about the sort, he was an educationist, leader of the um, campaign to abolish in, uh, in schools, in schools to abolish, I always want to say capital punishment, and I know that that was never actually legal in schools. Um, corporal, corporal punishment, <laughs> leader of the campaign to abolish corporal uh, punishment uh, in English schools, uh, writing here about what he would like children to learn. It's a small excerpt from his ideal curriculum, so different from the curriculum we have today. The wonder of the infinitely dynamic universe with its millions of galaxies and millions of stars within each galaxy. The place of our world in this immensity, not as an inconsequential speck in the ocean of space, but as of very great significance, because in our Earth, life exists. And you'll remember the great American humanist and cosmologist Carl Sagan, who said that his objection to the monotheistic religions, the religions of the Middle East, Christianity, Judaism, uh, Islam, um, was that they were so small. They didn't take this big, grand view that they claimed to be taking. They took a small, parochial view, this idea that just right here, um, in this tiny speck uh, in the universe, this is what it was really all about. Uh, and instead, um, we, with a different view, can push out into an incredibly, infinitely more interesting universe. That doesn't diminish the picture. I think it substantially expands it. Not just externally, but also internally. If we accept that we're animals with certain functions, we can understand much more about human psychology. We can understand much more about our inner life um, than different narratives of created semi-automata uh, would accord to human beings. So, objection number one. Objection number two, I think, is slightly more common. Humanists can have no morals, or I just can't understand why you're not a rapist. <laughs> this, this wor these words were said to me. Uh, genuinely by another person. Um, we were coming back uh, from a conference together, sharing an overlong train journey um, all the way uh, from where this was said. Um, I was representing the humanist organization. Uh, he was a Catholic priest. <laughs> and, and he said this. And we can understand, I think, we know, we're familiar with where this is coming from. Um, there's two variations of this argument. One is the idea um, that if you uh, don't have some sort of external, non-human, constant arbiter of right and wrong, someone else out there to set the standards, set the direction, set the benchmark, then you can't even ever really know what is right and wrong. That somehow you'll be pushed back onto hopeless, um, subjective, uh, groundless, uh, moral rules that, that, that for which there's really no reference point. That's one uh, way that this argument manifests itself. Another way is to say that in the absence of authorities in the here and now, religious texts, religious teachers, um, systems of uh, draconian law or, or uh, legal discipline, somehow human beings, in the absence of those codes, enforced codes, um, will not do right, will only do wrong, um, will, will be you know, uh, immoral in all their behavior. And that's uh, the basic claim that, that lies behind this objection. So what's the counter to it? Well, the first thing is to say that the whole claim, the whole objection, is premised on a, on a, on a, on a false, a very dim view of human beings, but also a very false one. A.J. Eyre, the philosopher um, who's president of the British Humanist Association for a while in the mid-20th mid century, points out the underlying assumption of this objection, of this claim, the underlying assumption is that only purely selfish behavior is natural. This assumption is false, and the conclusion that is drawn from it is therefore invalid. If experience shows that people act unselfishly as well as selfishly, we can only conclude that both types of behavior are natural. And if the capacity for evil is part of human nature, so is the capacity for good. The whole claim that human beings need this fear and favor, sanction-driven morality, they need to be chained down by moral rules to prevent them from harming others all the time because that's their nature, is really groundless. Not only is it a false and dim view um, of humanity, it also misrepresents what we increasingly know about the genuine origins of morality. And unfortunately for people who make this objection to humanism, we know more and more and more, uh, not only from uh, psychology, but from the fields of anthropology and social biology, we learn more and more and more about what the origin of morality really is. Now, that's really only reinforcing uh, what people like Charles Darwin were saying uh, more than a, a century ago, when they talked about, when they looked at the rest of the animal, 
uh, kingdom um, and said, you know, when we look at primates or other mammals um, and we see them behaving in social ways to each other, we, we never say that that's a gift from God. We never say that that's rules and religion that's causing that. We attribute it to natural causes. Why do we fail to attribute human behavior that is very much similar to natural causes? The social instincts, he said, the social instincts, the prime principle of man's moral constitution. He was writing uh, in the 19th century um, when uh, you know, man was an acceptable word to use. As you can see, it's a much more diverse world today. The prime principle um, of man's moral uh, constitution, with the aid of active intellectual powers and the effects of habit, naturally lead to the golden rule. As ye would that men should do to you, do ye to them likewise. And this lies at the foundation of morality. So there's no need to hypothesize some sort of extraterrestrial, extra-human origin point uh, for morality, uh, some moment where the flow of human events was interrupted from the outside and that diverted us from the, the red path we've been on to the path of civilization. The foundation of biology, built on, of course, by the effects of habit and by civilization over time, are a sufficient account uh, for the origins and beginnings of morality. So it's a false view of humanity. Um, it ignores what we know about the origins of morality. And in the same way that God isn't needed at the source of morality, religion isn't needed for its sustenance. So this is taking on the other claim uh, that is made, that somehow without these rules, these fear and favor systems, uh, there'll be no values, there'll be no morals. Margaret Knight, a great woman, um, many of you will uh, already be familiar with her. Um, she was a mid 20th century humanist, uh, a vice president of the, of the British Humanist Association, and until Jerry Springer, the opera, uh, she remained the most complained about uh, BBC output uh, ever. When she gave a talk in the 1950s, two talks, in fact, in the 1950s, on, I suppose, what would now be BBC Radio 4. It was the home service then, so it was BBC Home Service, and now probably most analogous to Radio 4, where she was, became a, briefly became a national hate figure um, exposed on the front page of all sorts of newspapers as the satanic Mrs. Knight. And it's quite interesting with the distance of history. You see this rather prim-looking 50s sort of housewife holding her handbag like this uh, with a nice little hat and a perm. It's the satanic Mrs. Knight um, <laughs> written over her. Um, because she, and her, you know, things were, her, her speech was burned outside the BBC and there were bishops calling for the BBC to pull the output, you know, before the second talk, in between the first and second talk, because she suggested um, that religion might be separable from morality, that you might have morality without religion, um, and in her second talk suggested that you might have moral education without religious education, for which, of course, she was uh, totally deplorable. Um, and it's a sign, actually, of how fast social attitudes can change, that I think only 10, 15 years after that, the reaction would have been, uh, neg well, was negligible to the same sort of claim. But nonetheless, uh, very briefly, uh, a trailblazer. She was a psychologist um, in her professional background, and particularly a child psychologist. And she points out here that you don't need religion to sustain uh, systems of morality. In fact, that's not what happens in practice. Why should I consider others, she asked. Myself, I think the only possible answer to this question is the humanist one, because we are naturally social beings. We live in communities, and life in any community, from the family outwards, is much happier and fuller and richer if the members are friendly and cooperative than if they're hostile and resentful. It's clear that for the successful flourishing of any society, um, there is uh, a prudential aspect um, to the observance of moral rules and of pro-social behaviors. And that's enough. Of course, you have to regulate society in other ways, and that's how we get law and the rule of law and other thoroughly humanistic concepts that um, have helped to shape the modern world. But nonetheless, um, it's the case that religion is not necessary. So that uh, is the response to uh, this moral objection. Having said that, though, although many objections to humanism uh, come from people who are, as it were, uh, innately hostile, they're not going to change uh, their minds. Um, they're, you know, they know what they think, and they don't want to hear any alternative. It's also the case, and we notice this at the BHA, obviously, when we get requests from advice for people for all sorts of, um, uh, all sorts of issues, personal issues, um, or just people wanting to know more, um, that some uh, objections 
uh, to humanism come from genuinely curious people, people who perhaps once were religious and now making the transition from that uh, metaphysics into a, a sounder one um, have questions um, and you know, are voicing objections that although um, they don't necessarily accept them in their own minds, they need the answers uh, themselves um, for the refuting of them. And so there's a caveat on this moral question, I think, which is that one should have sympathy um, with that. This is particularly true. The moral question that we get uh, at the BHA, this moral objection, often comes from parents, parents who, uh, new parents, children who are starting asking questions um, or they've just started primary school, and they're starting to be asked questions they can't really answer about why should you do this good thing rather than this bad thing, why, you know, what, what's fairness and so on and so forth. And they themselves, perhaps having had a religious upbringing, don't want to give the religious answer they were given when they themselves were children, but have an honest um, uh, incapacity to know what, the, what, what, what an acceptable answer might be. And John Stuart Mill, great 19th century humanist and philosopher and social reformer, um, expressed this rather well. He said that many, many having observed in others or experienced in themselves elevated feelings which they imagine incapable of emanating from any source other than religion, have an honest aversion to anything tending, as they think, to dry up the fountain of such feelings. So I think that honest aversion that people might have um, is a reminder to be generous um, and diplomatic, um, and whilst never uh, lying, um, making our, our arguments um, in ways that are respectful. Well, that's enough morality. Okay. <coughs> Too dry, too rational. You humanists, you desiccated materialists, you want to suck all the life and colour out of the universe, all the splendour all around us, and reduce it like a butterfly pinned under glass to a dry and dead equation. I know you do. I can see it in your eyes. When I give this talk to sceptic groups and say that, there's always someone in the back who goes, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> but that's not the case uh, here tonight. Or... Um, as it was uh, put to me uh, by a trainee teacher when I was giving a talk about humanism to trainee teachers, all, she was a young woman, all sort of scarves and curls and whale song and crystals. <laughs> you can't explain love with science. <laughs> so, I don't know what that's meant to mean. Well, <laughs> rather as uh, with... Um, the first objection about the centrality of the human beings to the universe, um, you have to be pretty uh, upfront um, about responding to this. Science is the way to understand much. The scientific method has provided a consistently reliable way of producing, yes, provisional answers, but nonetheless answers to questions about the nature and behavior of stuff. It is evidently rational, inquiry-based, and universal. Having said that, I think you have to then go on to point out that science itself can be an inspiration. The scientific endeavor, the struggle to understand the universe, the beauty of that curiosity and the impulse behind it is not a dry and desiccated endeavor. It's not dead. It's a very, very much a living enterprise. Richard Dawkins, all the great religions have a place for awe, for ecstatic transport at the wonder and beauty of creation. And it's exactly this feeling of spine shivering awe Almost worship, he's cheeky, almost worship. This flooding of the chest with ecstatic wonder that modern science can provide. Now, science doesn't make me particularly horny, I have to say. I'm a, I'm a, a humanities uh, person by background, but nonetheless, I observe as a, as a social fact that there are people of whom this is true. Um, science does, I'm married to one. Science, is, science does not uh, have to be and is not for the, most of its practitioners, um, this desiccating enterprise um, that its objectors, that the objectors to this aspect of humanism uh, hold it to be. It can provide that awe. And I pause here for the first of my two jokes of the evening. There is um, this film, I don't know whether you've seen it, it's called The Greatest Story Ever Told. Yeah, fictional film. And it's about, it's about this character um, called Jesus, um, and he goes around, I mean, he's a bit odd, um, he says some strange things, but he generally goes around trying to be nice to people and trying to encourage other people to be nice. Occasionally he becomes a bit vengeful, but he's, he's generally a good character. And at the end of it, in a sort of um, uh, rather upsetting scene, um, he gets executed. Uh, he gets... Sorry, you wanted to see it, didn't you? Now you've got to ruin the story. You could read the book. 
I think that has a different ending right at the end. And he gets executed. It's very sad. Um, and he gets crucified. It's a nasty way to be executed. It's not the worst, but it's, it's, it's pretty bad for the times. And um, in a shock twist, it turns out just at the point uh, that he is dying that actually all along he was the son of God, which he sort of said he was, sort of didn't. And God is very upset. And so, you know, uh, he causes an earthquake and makes the sun go black and, and, and the earth tremors. And everyone goes, shit, he was the son of God, if only he'd said. Um, and it's, it's, it's very dramatic. And close at hand, in order to observe this uh, cataclysmic response that the universe is making to the death of what turns out to be the son of God, is a Roman centurion uh, played by, I've forgotten the name. Thank you, John Wayne. <laughs> Very useful to have you close at hand. Uh, played by John Wayne, who, as those of you uh, who are fans of him, will know he's not a very good actor. He hasn't got tremendous range, let's put it that way. Some would say he hadn't got the, the requisite range to be up to the task of uh, responding to the death of the Son of God, but he was cast in the role, so there you go. So here's the scene. Imagine I am John Wayne. Not difficult. Here's the man hung like this. And... Come on. <laughs> and I'm looking up, and there's this cataclysm, and, and my, only, my only line is to draw attention in an awestruck way um, to the fact uh, that this is the Son of God who has died, and we're all tremendously shocked by the news. Action. Surely this man was the Son of God. Cut. No, no, no. No, John. Um, no, no, John. It was good. We sort of got, you know, the fact that this was terror and, you know, wonder and regret and, and, and all. But we need a bit more awe. Just do it again. Just one more take with a bit more awe. Okay? Okay, John? Yeah, I got it. Okay. That's John Wayne. I got it. Okay. Action. <laughs> oh! Surely this man was the son of God. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, uh, science, uh, much like my jokes, can be a source of inspiration, uh, bringing warmth and colour to your otherwise dismal lives. That's an important part of the response to this objection. But equally, I think we have to accept um, and try to understand uh, the thinking behind people who make this objection out of, as it were, an honest aversion, just like we did a moment ago um, with morality. Oh, these people say, you can't explain away love uh, with your science. You can't explain away the way I feel about my grandchildren. You can't explain away the way I feel um, about you know, Beethoven's sixth or whatever. You can't explain away uh, the beauty of a rainforest. And the important part in all of that is this idea of explaining it away. This idea that somehow what the scientific enterprise is about is stripping the meaning and colour um, out of existence and denying the reality of our inner life the reality of our feelings, the fact that we attribute meaning to experience, the fact that we tell stories and are meaning-making creatures as well as creatures that observe and explore and seek to understand the natural world. Brendan Lavo, who is a humanist philosopher at the University of Hertfordshire, I think puts this um, very well when he says one of the challenges for humanists is to explain that there is more to life than natural science can register without invoking anything supernatural. In meeting that challenge, we will draw on our common culture, including the better parts of religious traditions within it. However, we will not have fallen into theology. I like that visual image, the idea that theology is some empty, vacuous, which of course it is, um, absence that you might sort of fall into. <laughs> anyway, we will not have fallen into theology because in drawing on the poets, dramatists, novelists, historians, and the stories of the religions, we will not pretend these stories are anything other than what they are, tales told by humans to humans. So I think it's an important part of responding to this objection to say that we recognize that for a complete account of human experience, the universe inside our heads is as important as the universe external to us and is a different sort of place. Ah, now this is a, a good objection in a way because it comes from, as it were, non-religious people quite often as uh, just as um, religious ones, though of course it also comes uh, from religious ones. This is the idea that uh, atheism sometimes, um, but mainly humanism, is some sort of 
religion, secular religion. Or, uh, as one rabbi friend said to me, and she tickled herself so much with this remark that uh, when she first said it, we were having a drink together, she was so happy with this funny that she'd made. Uh, I didn't like to tell her we receive it every day by email <laughs> and on postcards in green ink from all across the world. Nonetheless, we do. Your Pope is Richard Dawkins. <laughs> There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a sort of piquant irony to be savoured in this, is that very often when religious people are saying this, the sort of subtext is you're just as bad as we are. You know, this is sort of admission. Um, they've taken on board the suggestion and internalised it, um, that actually they're, they're, they're pretty naughty. But, you know, we're just as bad. Well, um, it's worth uh, pausing at this moment, to respond to this objection by talking a little bit positively about what humanism actually is, what the word humanism is used to mean today. Well, the word humanism uh, is a descriptive word applied retrospectively after the fact, as it were, uh, from about the late 19th century. It had other meanings before then, but in the late 19th century, it comes to be used in the way we use it today to a certain set of beliefs and values. Um, but the beliefs and values described by this word uh, are at least as old as recorded history, for as long as we know that men and women have been engaging with the big questions of what is and what matters and who we are and, and, and what can we do about it, there have been uh, people who have given answers that today we describe as humanist. So this is very important. I've usefully highlighted in bold for you the most important uh, words um, in this slide. So it's a descriptive word, and that's really important. You know, it's not the case that there was ever a Mr. Human uh, who invented this philosophy and after whom uh, it was named. It isn't an identity you know, that has a particular origin point and is then promulgated and shared um, and promoted uh, in this way. It's applied retrospectively. So um, it would be impossible, really, for an Aboriginal Australian before the conquest of Australia by Europeans to have been a Christian because they'd simply never have heard um, of the central figure um, of that ideology. Um, but... Um, they could very well have been a humanist, and the word could be applied to them, as it were, analytically. It's not dependent um, on cultural context. It isn't even dependent on self-description. And it applies to a certain set of beliefs um, and values. There's no question of identity until recently, when we started having humanist organizations, at least. There's no question of identity, and there's no question of, as it were, um, observance or practices. It's, it's beliefs and values. Very quickly, if you imagine a sort of Venn diagram in the middle of which you might find humanism, I suppose there might be about five circles that constitute a modern definition of that uh, word. Um, humanists are people who accept naturalism and use the scientific method to gain knowledge. So there are two ways of looking at uh, reality. One is that reality is what we can uh, experience, what we can perceive, what we can discern through our senses, even if we have to magnify it or uh, uh, you know, look at it uh, through technology because it's far away. Nonetheless, it's through our senses that we experience reality. The other idea about reality, a sort of non-humanist idea common to almost all religions, is that this isn't all there is. That they're actually beyond this tangible uh, realm, there is another world. And that's where you get the intangibles, ghosts and goblins and genies and gods and all that, all that sort of stuff. Humanists are obviously people who take accept the former um, as a statement of how the universe is. They're people who accept that this one life um, is all we know we have. Something a bit provisional there. Maybe all, we could say all we have, but I think all we know we have is safer for the moment. No. Actually, I don't really think that, as we'll, as we'll come to later. People who accept um, that morality is something that arises, as we were discussing earlier, not out of some external cosmic cause, uh, but out of human nature and culture. People who believe that what is right is what promotes human welfare and fulfillment almost become something to which there's very little alternative in the modern world, actually. This idea of what constitutes right and wrong has become so all-conquering that people often forget that there are viable alternatives. Uh, unfortunately, the success of many religious groups in the world, but also totalitarian uh, political ideologies of various sorts, racisms and nationalisms as well, remind us that this idea um, that when you think about what is right, the test, the criterion you should be using is human welfare in the round and human fulfillment rather than adherence to tribe or nation or sacred text is uh, not as all pervasive as it could be. But nonetheless, this is an important circle in our Venn diagram uh, to constitute humanism. And lastly, this idea 
that in the absence of any discernible trajectory uh, to the universe, um, meaning uh, isn't something that is discovered at the end of the rainbow, uh, out there waiting, uh, written into the universe that you can read off a la carte or like some cosmic knitting pattern, uh, but instead meaning is something that is created by human beings individually and together uh, in this world. So these, this would be a good minimum definition um, of what humanism is. And you see that it's pretty distinctive in the round, taking, all, taking the centre of this Venn diagram into account, pretty distinctive and can be distinguished from uh, every religion that you can think of. And these ideas, although they've been incredibly influential in, in the recent Western world, are not, in fact, culturally distinctive in the way that religious ideas are, or are at their origin, at least. Many religions become uh, global, Two in particular have become very widespread uh, at the present time, uh, Christianity and Islam, of course. Um, humanist ideas, though, are a permanent alternative that recur throughout time and globally. You can find these ideas, genuinely full worked out versions of these ideas, um, in the European world, uh, starting about two and a half thousand years ago. In fact, for a thousand years, they constitute the mainstream view of educated men and women in the ancient Greek and Roman world. You can find them in China. Um, starting at about the same time, followers of Confucius, but maybe not Confucius himself, because he thinks a lot about other realms, even though it's not quite clear what he means, but certainly um, uh, post-Confucian uh, Chinese thinkers like Mencius, Mengzi, who is, you know, was called by 19th century philosophers the Chinese David Hume, because he's so much um, a humanist in the... Oh, maybe it was named after a person, humanism. No, bad joke. Shall I put that in for, for next? No. Um, the Chinese David Hume, because of his uh, humanist uh, beliefs in India um, around the same time, Charvaka, wonderful, almost like classical Indian Richard Dawkins is. They really hate priests. Not that Richard hates priests, but they, they, <laughs> they, they, they're very hostile to organised religion and to systematised superstition. Um, very virulent about it, very firm about it um, in an entirely commendable way. And... Uh, in the same way, saying that morality is uh, a this-worldly affair, um, that, that knowledge is provisional, and so on and so forth. In fact, the Charvaka thinking has become sort of so mainstreamed into Hindu thinking in some ways that there's a, uh, it is actually a present part of, of, of the Hindu tradition. The Cambridge philosopher Simon Blackburn, any of you heard of Simon Blackburn? He's vice president of the BHA. Um, he doesn't teach anymore. He's too... He's too uh, grand and retired for that. Um, he's an excellent philosopher. You should read all of his books because they're fantastic. Um, he had a, a student uh, at Cambridge. Um, he was telling this story to us a few, a few months ago. He had a student at Cambridge um, who was uh, Indian uh, by ethnicity and whose father was very, very staunchly Hindu. He was a very religious, devout, uh, pious uh, man. Um, and Simon Blackburn's student had, was very worried about going home at the end of first or second term, because he had become a humanist in the course of his philosophical uh, studies. He no longer believed that the uh, universe was um, a supernatural place, but that it was a natural place. He no longer believed um, that morality was uh, inspired from outside, but he believed it was a, a prudential human invention. Uh, he believed uh, no longer in, in priestcraft, but in uh, the scientific endeavor. And he was terrified about uh, going back to his father and, and coming out um, in this way. But when he came back to Simon, uh, Simon's tutorial at the beginning of the next term, and Simon asked him how it went. It had gone uh, surprisingly well. He'd gone home and said to his father all that he believed, um, everything that he rejected um, of what he knew of his, his father's uh, religion, everything that he'd now adopted in terms of a scientific rationalism. And his father sat for a moment, stony-faced, and then beamed with joy. I said, my son, how wonderful. You've embraced the Charvaka strand of Hinduism. <laughs> And the whole, the whole uh, problem uh, had been avoided. How different a world uh, it might have been if it had been Hinduism that had spread um, globally rather than some of the uh, alternatives. Well, uh, that's something to consider uh, later on. The Arab world um, in the Middle Ages, while Europe is languishing under the cult of Christianity, um, there are various people in the Arab world who are getting on with some serious thought. And although it never reaches, as it were, the same pinnacle that it does in other parts of the world, uh, nonetheless achieves uh, a great amount, um, and there is humanism there. And then, of course, the, the, the more recent story of the Western world, from the Enlightenment onwards, uh, European uh, intellectual life fed by what was being learned from China, uh, by what had been rediscovered from the Arab world a few 
100 years before from what was being discovered of India and from the new uh, enlightenment uh, of scientific and rational thinking, uh, Western culture, which is to which humanism is all, almost now the wallpaper, uh, if not um, all pervasive. Um, Western culture, of course, embodies humanist ideas in many ways. So let's not hear nonsense about how humanism is in some way a religion. It is as different as it could be from every uh, angle um, uh, from uh, religions. Well, here's a nice one. Uh, humanism is a myth of human progress. It's utopian. Humanists are too optimistic. They ignore massive historical tragedies in favor of a confected narrative of human progress that will culminate one day in the future bliss of all mankind, and this is unwarranted uh, utopianism. Now, a sort of people who make this sort of claim, uh, well, John Gray, have any of you ever uh, uh, read in a book by John Gray? Very sensible. Well done. Um, John Gray uh, is a man who has written lots of books about how awful humanism is, about how it's just a sort of mindless, naive, secularizing of Christian optimism. He's not religious. Uh, he's a sort of nihilist, I suppose. Uh, in some ways, his ideas are very valid, but in this criticism, he's, he's a bit off. Um, and he says that he makes this sort of point uh, that there's a sort of mindless utopianism um, about, about the humanist view. Too much faith in, in human beings, essentially. It's this idea that um, if you don't have something above humanity, then humanity starts to sort of get above itself um, and elevating uh, its own nature, deifying its own uh, nature. Karen Armstrong, some of you have probably read books by her. Um, she is a uh, former nun who um, decided that wasn't for her anymore and became instead um, uh, an author and celebrated uh, literary uh, figure, writing books like about Muhammad or about you know, how all the religions are really one or about you know, the golden rule. And it's difficult to know what her own religious beliefs might be at this point. She's sort of a vague Gnostic um, in, in the ancient Christian uh, tradition. She's certainly not a nun anymore. Um, whether or not she's still, still a Christian. And she has this same sort of sentiment, the idea that actually we're not that great. Um, and the big risk um, is that we will uh, forget that, that we will sort of be too optimistic about what we can achieve and sort of allow that to run away with itself. Well, the first part of the response, I think, is to say that um, far from wanting to be optimistic, you know, wide-eyedly, uh, naively optimistic, um, humanists are people who try to take a a realistic view uh, of life, of its possibilities, of humanity um, and our possibilities. But nonetheless, it's quite wise to look cautiously on the bright side. Philip Pullman, when this criticism was put to him, said, I'm 51% optimistic. And I think that's uh, quite a good response. Because when you think about it, it's quite difficult to, to, to see immediately what the enormous downsides of optimism are supposed to be. Oh, looking on the bright side, how dreadful, said no one ever. Um, it reminds me, of, there was a, we did something called the Atheist Bus Campaign um, quite a long time now ago, actually, um, six years ago. Um, I don't know if any of you saw it or in, in London at the time. It was a series of bus adverts um, inspired by, there were some Christian bus adverts that said, you know, Jesus is coming and you better watch out. Uh, or words to that effect. Uh, you'll all be in trouble when he comes. And um, there was a, a Guardian journalist who said, this is a bit off, uh, not very nice, a bit worrying for people. Um, and so instead, we should have uh, posters that give a more inspiring message. And so she suggested, there's probably no God. Uh, now, stop worrying and enjoy your life. And it was very upbeat, very inspiring. We raised 160,000 pounds for it over a couple of months. We, ra we wanted to raise 10,000, so it was, a, it was an embarrassment of buses uh, that, we ended, that we ended up with. And we had a lot of abuse for it uh, from religious groups, yes, of course, um, but also from some non-religious people um, who filled our mailbags with this uh, protest against the fact that we'd said probably. Um, and that actually we should have said, there is no God, we know it, um, now fuck off. Or you know, whatever their, their preferred alternative, probably less successful, um, would have been. And so you know, we got used to opening 
uh, this uh, post. Um, and when we opened one letter one day, we expected more of the same. But instead, what we got was a letter from someone who said, I think your new campaign is deplorable. Uh, I'm not religious, but I just cannot understand why you are telling people to enjoy their lives. <laughs> and it, uh, and it, it turned out um, that he was very upset because he thought there was, the world was such a dreadful place and there was so much to do. Uh, in fact, people shouldn't be enjoying themselves. They should be getting out and sorting out the world. Well, that's a point of view. But um, it reminds me always of this uh, sort of objection uh, to humanism. Well, what are we meant to do? Go around looking on the worst side all the time, being totally pessimistic. I mean, what's the point of that? What's that going to bring you? In fact, um, looking on the, on the bright side, being optimistic, can often be a benefit uh, to human beings. The idea that you can make an improvement might lead to you making the improvement. You've set out your front door with some aim in view, thinking you're going to achieve it, then you're more likely to achieve it than if you stay at home thinking nothing good will ever happen. In this building, um, in 2009, when we had the World uh, Conference of the International Humanist Union, I was extremely impressed with a group from the Ugandan Humanist Association. They do amazing things. They build schools, um, they build refuges for women who've been forced into prostitution where they can learn a new trade. They run girls' football teams to um, break down taboos and empower uh, young women. They do all sorts, all sorts of wonderful work. And they stood up and they talked about the basis, the foundation in their own thought for why they, they did this work. And they said, well, we just believe that you know, ordinary men and women have the capacity to take their destiny into their own hands, look forward to the future with optimism and make a difference. And I thought, yes, absolutely. That is what optimism can do for you. It can carry in itself the seed of its own fulfillment. And so I don't think that it's wise to give too much ground uh, to those people who want to do away with optimism. Not at all. Equally, of course, it's nonsense to suggest, as some people like John Gray do, that there has somehow been no progress um, in the history um, of humanity. And that uh, a look back to the past that uh, portrays it as generally a narrative of improvement is somehow deeply flawed. I don't think that's true. Now, if you want a big, long book about it, obviously, very recently, Stephen Pinker has published his excellent um, book about uh, why things are always getting better. But I think the, the little poem of Stevie Smith uh, captures it more succinctly. Those who are always praising the past, and especially the time of faith as best, ought to go and live in the Middle Ages and be burnt at the stake as witches and sages. <laughs> Things have got better. Not for everyone everywhere all of the time. And obviously, the gross inequality that exists in the world is not only uh, one of the greatest tragedies for our species, but is also one of the greatest moral crises of, of our time. But nonetheless, improvement is not mythical. I think the other thing about these objectors, and people who make this sort of objection, um, is that they would not like to go back and live uh, in the Middle Ages at the same time as they criticise this uh, optimistic Enlightenment attitude. Karen Armstrong is no longer a nun. She has exchanged the nun's cell for a very more, much more comfortable world, one imagines, of literary salons and uh, publishers' fairs. And John Gray, uh, who is at the LSE, has been very rightly criticised for uh, criticising the Enlightenment from the padded comfort of an Enlightenment institution. And I think that is often uh, a tendency uh, amongst uh, these people. Well, the objectors uh, to humanism know no internal consistency, so we pass uh, from the allegation uh, that humanism, the humanist view, uh, is naively optimistic to the idea that it is totally nihilistic. The pointlessness of it all. Humanism is nihilism. If there is no God, no future life, and the universe is a totally natural phenomenon, then the universe has no purpose. That means that our lives are meaningless. We might as well never have lived because nothing means anything. It doesn't take you long um, to recognize uh, in this argument where the, the fatal gap is. The universe has no purpose. That means our lives are meaningless. OK, so here's my joke. It's uh, an academic conference, science, something. and. Um, how many scientists are there in here tonight? Oh, oh. oh, excellent. OK. Go, scientists. Um, and it's a conference about something sciencey, which has to do uh, with stars um, and the sun. Um, and there's probably a scientific word for it. But it's about that. Astrophysics. Is that right? No astrophysicists in the house anyway. OK. Um, astrophysics conference. And it's a big conference hall, uh, really big, full, much more people than are here now. And 
it stretches back, you know, sort of 50 rows, um, and, you know, the scientists are all on, on, on the stage, and they're answering questions about uh, the sun and how it's going to eventually, uh, you know, blow up. <laughs> That's probably not right. It's going to blow up and uh, engulf the earth and everything, uh, all the other bits and pieces. Uh, and a very worried man uh, is waving his hand for the first question at the very back of the hall. He's extremely agitated when the first question is, I've just got to ask, did you just say that the sun is going to blow up and engulf the earth in 13 million years? No, 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 says the man at the front. No, no, no. I said 13 billion. Oh, thank goodness, says the man <laughs> uh, at the back, much relieved. The vanity, the incoherence, in fact, um, of trying to link uh, your life, uh, our present experience, and the meaning that we ascribe to it on this earth to, to these cosmic events uh, so far uh, in the distance, which at compound discount mean nothing to you um, in the here and now at all. The vanity of that um, is incredible, just as bad uh, as the vanity and just as pointless um, as the vanity of trying to create ourselves, set ourselves up as the pinnacle of creation, as in the first objection uh, that we looked at. Well, if it's so silly, which it is, um, then where does this objection to humanism come from and how can we try and counter it? Well, Bertrand Russell, who never minced his words, um, had a very clear uh, response. The origin of all this, uh, he said, is a fear. It's fear, and specifically it's fear of death. Bertrand Russell, vice president of the, of the BHA, as well as other things. Um, religion, since it has its source in terror, he didn't pull his punches. Religion, since it has its source in terror, has dignified certain sorts of fear and made people think them not disgraceful. In this, it has done mankind a great disservice. All fear is bad. I believe that when I die, I shall rot and nothing of my ego will survive. I am not young and I love life, but I should scorn to shiver with terror at the thought of annihilation. Many a man has borne himself proudly on the scaffold. Surely the same pride should teach us to think truly about our place in the world. And I think he's correct about that, of course. I think that what lies behind uh, this objection is fear, and it's a fear that distracts um, from what can be instead um, a greater courage uh, of human beings and a greater dignity. So that's the first part of the response, I think, is to identify this fear, to diagnose it, um, to analyze why it's there. The second part, I think, um, is to question um, whether or not uh, the fact um, that our lives are going to end, that the universe um, has no destination, um, is actually reducing the picture for us at all. Um, I can't remember whether it was Richard Dawkins or a friend of Richard Dawkins whose experience he recounts, um, but uh, there's, a, there's a story of uh, him at a conference saying, you know, oh, this life is all we have, and uh, no, sorry, this life is, is the only life, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and someone comes up and says, surely, Professor Dawkins, you can't believe this is all there is. And the response he receives is, what do you mean all? Matthew Arnold, great 19th century poet, of course, um, is it so small a thing to have enjoyed the sun? to have lived light in the spring, to have loved, to have thought, to have done, to have advanced true friends and beat down baffling foes, that we must feign a bliss of doubtful future date, and while we dream on this, lose all our present state and relegate to worlds yet distant our repose. True words, and specifically true because they highlight the great risk of locating um, meaning and significance in your own life somehow outside um, of the here and now, you run the risk of seriously devaluing the existence um, that you experience. And that is as a result of fear. So expose the fear that lies behind this objection. Identify the devaluation of our present experience, short, very short um, as it is, um, that arises from that, and take it on. And then I think reaffirm, affirm and then reaffirm again, um, the humanist uh, case that actually life is enough. E.M. Forster, probably my favorite uh, British humanist, uh, vice president of the, of, the, of the British Humanist Association. The human race to which the individual belongs may not survive, but that should not deter him. 
Wherever our race comes from, wherever it is going, whatever his own fissures and weaknesses, he himself is here, is now. He must understand, create, contact. And the heading of this slide comes again from James Hemming, who wrote about the infinitely wondrous universe um, at the beginning uh, of the talk, when he was asked what the meaning of life was, and he said, no, no, in life, the meaning comes in living. This, I think, is the complete and final response to the idea that somehow only a point to the universe and a future existence for ourselves can give meaning to our experiences here and now. The alternative is based on fear. It's rightly called a death cult, um, and in different periods of history has manifested itself in that way, people hastening towards the end, hastening towards the end, looking beyond the end of their lives, and in doing so, missing everything that is real and rich and varied um, in between, everything that gives life depth and colour instead of embracing what humanists have always known and what we still assert uh, today, that is here and now in our lives, in the relationships that we build, in the goals we adopt, in the things we do, in the experiences that we have, um, that really provides any meaning at all and all the meaning there is and a lot of meaning to our experience. Thank you. <laughs>